Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk about the Portland building. And uh, my name is Brian Libby, and uh, uh, we've got four of us here. Uh, I think three of us are in Portland, Oregon, and one is in New Jersey. And uh, uh, we're excited to share with you what we've learned about the Portland building and, and in the case of these panelists, their experiences. And uh, um, the Portland building, as a lot of you know, has a big place in postmodern history. and. Uh, um, our mayor here in Portland said it was going to be our Eiffel Tower, and uh, it's got the second largest statue in the United States, the Portlandia statue, which is uh, a phrase a lot of people now know from a TV show. Um, but what people may not know is just how bad a shape the building was in. It was uh, leaking for decades, really. And um, uh, that's just the beginning of some of the issues inside and out that it had. And so uh, we're here to uh, uh, kind of take that apart a little bit and, and uh, um, chat and a uh, um, uh, little bit about our panelists here. Um, uh, we've got Patrick Burke, AIA, uh, who is a principal at Michael Graves Architecture and Design, and he just he joined the firm uh, uh, during the Portland building process before the building was completed. Um, we've got Kristen Wells, RA, uh, a project manager from the city of Portland, and she really was a, a leader in making sure that this was a collaborative process that really got the job done both functionally and in a lot of other ways, too. Um, we've got Erica Cedar here, who is really the guiding architect, uh, but is, of course, a part of a team, but um, uh, really the person who I've seen leading uh, in a lot of ways uh, um, and figuring out the, the, the myriad of different issues and design problems uh, 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 along the way. And uh, um, again, my name is Brian Libby and I'm a freelance journalist here in Portland and I write for um, some architecture magazines like Metropolis and Dwell and um, occasionally the New York Times. And uh, I've been writing about the Portland building for just about as long as I can remember. And uh, um, it's an interesting site uh, long before the Portland building was even here. It was a really cool jazz club at one time. And, uh, but we're here to talk about Michael Graves and the legacy of his firm and uh, to talk a little bit about what we can learn from uh, this really kind of, in some ways, uncommon or unprecedented renovation that has a lot to teach us about the nature of, the evolving nature of historic preservation. So on screen here, you can see a, a photo of the, a second ago, the completed building uh, post renovation. And uh, we'll go here into some of the basics. Uh, as a lot of you know, it was designed by Michael Graves and completed in 1982. And um, it's really pretty much the first major postmodern public building in the United States. And there are some others that um, are you know, very significant that are right around that time as well. Um, but it had uh, a $22 million original construction budget, and that was substantially lower than the uh, per square foot cost of a commercial building at the time. And so you can't ever separate the architecture from the budget when you're talking about the Portland building and its history. Um, uh, but it was uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2011, and that was a time where they were starting to become an open conversation about the future of the building and maybe even the possibility that, that it could have been torn down. Uh, but the National Register listing was maybe a beginning of uh, a different kind of process uh, starting up. So um, we're glad you're here. And um, uh, um, uh, you're seeing now uh, a photo of the building uh, at the time it was constructed and you see uh, that were some a lot of decisions that were made related to the budget that we're going to get into, um, including a building that was mostly painted concrete, something, as I understand, you would never do today. Uh, and that um, we're going to get into all kinds of different facade material options that there were both originally and uh, a couple of years ago when they started talking about the renovation. Um, uh, many of those original materials uh, did not hold up over time, and there were a lot of things about the design that Michael Graves and his team, you know, came to feel somewhat uh, compromised about, uh, that that um, really it was not the best building it could be. Um, uh, everybody faces limitations and challenges with budgets, whether it's a single family house or the Taj Mahal, or maybe not the Taj Mahal, but, um, you know, budget is, uh, that in some ways, we've all come to believe that the renovation actually completed the design, if that makes any sense. So, um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a quick overview of, the, uh, of some of the re reconstruction basics that we talked about. Um, it began in 2016 officially, and it was obviously talked about before then. Uh, we're going to get into that. And it was a progressive design build project. And I think I alluded to the fact that collaboration was so important with this. You know, uh, um, it's, a, it's an icon and an architectural landmark, but it just had a lot of 
problems to figure out and a lot of interconnected problems uh, related to uh, inside and out. Um, the completion, it was completion, uh, it was required by December 31st of 2020, and it was a full interior and exterior renovation that included a new exterior skin over the original historic facade, which is, again, a lot of what we're going to talk about, but it was really a transformation inside and out. I mean, I got to tell you, it's astonishing when you go inside this building uh, if you've been in there before the renovation, um, and, and for the better. Um, so um, you see uh, uh, some images here of the reconstruction itself uh, and uh, uh, the decisions that were made to create a rain screen facade and to change out some of the glass and to go to an aluminum uh, cladding as well, uh, a, a unitized curtain wall skin, I believe you would call it. Um, uh, but it did a very, very good job of recreating the look and feel of the design. And of course, with postmodernism, that's a, 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 to a great degree what it's all about. Um, so um, from a, a preservation standpoint, um, that was somewhat unprecedented, but it really, in some ways, is something that a lot of postmodern buildings and more recent buildings, as they become officially historic, are gonna face. So you see here in uh, the next slide, uh, I know there's a lot on screen there, but it is just a good way of showing you that um, this is a lead platinum design and it meets well building certification as well. And so it wasn't just about it being an architectural landmark and fixing problems. It was about making this a, a truly sustainable building inside and out that, that um, is full of light uh, like never before and really um, allows employees to do their best and to feel their best and to be their most productive. Um, and it's, that's really, the, the, ins, the, the this is a building all about the way it looks on the outside to so many people in Portland or in the architecture community, but inside is really where the most transformation occurred. And uh, you see here in slide 10, uh, a back-to-back -back of the before and after, and, and you see some slightly different color tones there. And um, that is really not a, a representation of how they made a decision to change the color of the original, but more like how it returned to the tone of the original. There had been some fading that had happened over time. So uh, uh, we're gonna get into some questions here soon. Um, uh, and we're gonna be talking about uh, the legacy of postmodernism, but, but I believe if, we're not, if I'm not mistaken, we have a, a clip coming up here in a second. Um, uh, uh, um, this is a, um, we have coming up in a second an interview um, uh, that Michael Graves did on his uh, first visit to Portland. Um, I'm going to make sure I'm on the right slide. Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, we have a video clip coming up uh, of Michael Graves just before the renovation decision was made. Michael Graves, it was pretty dramatic. He came to Portland uh, not long before he ended up passing away and um, really kind of making a statement that he believe the building should survive and, and really helped us have a conversation about it. And I think I was actually at a dinner where it was whispered to him that the building was going to was gonna live on and that it was going to be renovated and not torn down. But officially, it was not at all decided. And so it was pretty dramatic. So um, am I correct that we're ready to run that uh, clip now? So please join me in welcoming Michael Graves. I stood across the street with my, my nurse men and we said, it's so uplifting, it's so glorious, look at it. And there was Portlandia and there was the building and it was, it was absolutely shimmering. It was amazing. I was struck by somebody last night at dinner saying what they loved about the Portland building was the conversation it causes about architecture, positive and negative. but still a conversation and it's so full of ideas that you can you have something to battle on and with rational grown-up terms not just i like it or i don't like it not just visceral terms mm -hmm. that was a really stirring evening uh uh i think a couple of you may have been there and um uh we're going to get into our questions now and um, uh, Patrick, uh, you, you joined Michael Graves uh, um, uh, when this building was in process. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit for us about, um, with the hindsight of history, uh, how you see the, the legacy of postmodernism. Uh, uh, we have a slide on screen here with uh, 
the Congress Center by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, which is right by the Portland building. It even provided offices, construction offices, I, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, uh, it's it's indicative. It's a uh, it's telling that it's SOM. You know, this is kind of in some ways, even though Portland doesn't have really tall buildings, this is kind of like the the quintessential American office tower of the 70s or early 80s. And and so how might you put into context what postmodernism was? It was in some ways a response to modernism, and maybe some might have said an aberration in that it was postmodernism was postmodernism was relatively short lived. But it, you know, like Michael Graves said, it really did prompt a conversation about architecture and specifically about the real relationship and the influence of history on contemporary architecture. And so um, how do you see all that? Uh, yeah, at the time the Portland building was designed from uh, 79 and built, completed in October 82, there was a real inflection point in the profession of architecture. And it was a little bit of the young guys against the establishment. So it was it was a bit of a reaction. So the building you see on the left, which is across the street from the Portland building, is where architecture had gotten to through the 50s, 60s, 70s. We were starting to build these very banal formulaic buildings. And the 70s were a very dull decade, high interest rates. The economy was kind of flat. We had an oil embargo. The price of oil soared. And there wasn't a lot of work for architects. And so if you go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, These are suddenly, some of those yeah. young architects. Yeah, they're teaching uh, in various schools of architecture. Theory is starting to get pulled into architecture. They're starting to look at history again, where the modern movement had kind of turned its back on history. Now architects are starting to talk about why were those historical buildings so great? And how do they compare to our modern buildings? Um, yeah. And they were listening to each other. And they were starting to write in publications that didn't exist. And while it was never really a cohesive movement. It was never a group of guys saying, we're all going to go someplace. It wasn't even called postmodernism then. There was something in the air. There was definitely a reaction. Um, and you see in the picture on the left, in the center, you see Philip Johnson, who was a couple of generations older than most of these guys. And he found them kind of interesting. He liked the brashness of this group. Um, he was listening to the things they were talking about. And in a building he did in the late 70s, I think it was finished in 78, the AT&T building in New York, he incorporated some of these sort of historical features, things that these young architects were talking about. And it became the most famous building in the United States for a couple of years. And it put yeah. Bill Johnson on the cover of Time magazine with a, a, a cape over his back and a model of the AT&T building. But it's sort of got the runway going for these young architects to get opportunities to do this. Yeah. And Philip Johnson wound up being the professional advisor to the Portland Building Competition, which began, I believe, at the end of 1979. And they selected three firms to do the competition. Two of them were establishment firms that would have been in uh, Philip Johnson's generation building big commercial projects. And one of these young upstarts, Michael Graves, who had really not built anything more than residential architecture. Um, at the conclusion of the competition, uh, and they were all told the budget was tough and you have to meet it. We're not going to spend a penny more than $22 million. Uh, so at the end of the competition, the submittals came in, and Michael had started hoping to build the building with um, Gladding's McBean glazed terracotta tile. But we had a New York contractor, instructional engineer on our team, we were checking uh, costs, and they said, no, you, we can't afford to do this in glaze tile. So by the end of the competition, Michael handed in a building designed in stucco. The other two firms said, well, we can't provide all of your program and meet the budget, so here's what we can provide and still meet your budget. If you want us to achieve all of your program, you're going to have to come up with this many more million dollars. So the city of Portland thought about this and they said, well, we're not gonna come up with more money, but we're not gonna build a big building out of stucco. So you guys will have to go back to the drawing board and, and do this again. I think they made some subtle changes, but not big changes uh, in the hope that that might get the price down. And when they came back, uh, our contractor had a, there was a, a famous meeting on a Sunday morning where they came down to Princeton to tell Michael We've come up with a solution where we can get in the budget, but you're going to have to accept 
a facade that's painted concrete. And what we're going to do is we're going to make the facade the structural system, and then we're just going to paint it. Uh, and Michael said, uh, I don't care what the F you make it out of. You can make it out of effing oatmeal for all I care. Let's get in the budget. Because he knew he had no other route to get this project. While the two establishment firms kept assuming that, well, we're established. We're not going to go that well with the budget. They'll have to come up with more money. So in that last round of the competition, the two other architects came back and said, we still can't meet the budget. So Michael wound up with the project. And again, at that time, there was no such thing as postmodernism that we knew about. But boy, was it a controversial building. And it was yeah. the number one topic of discussion in the profession for the couple of years it was getting done. Um, I was in graduate school from 80 to 82 at Princeton. So we were very much aware of what was going on in Michael's office. At the beginning of 82, I wound up joining the office. And we were just so buzzed about this project. Um, Later in the 80s, Charles Jenks wrote a, a book about postmodernism, and he kind of coined the phrase, or at least he was seen as the person who coined the phrase. And if you go to the next. Yeah, we have some articles here. Uh, you see on screen a few different local newspaper articles, and, and this really speaks to the fact that this was uh, a controversial project, uh, um, you know, it's prompting a conversation in the profession, but also really here locally as well. I think people liked that it had some kind of boldness and stylistic uh, newness to it. But um, you had an establishment that was pretty opposed. Uh, Portland's most famous architect of, the, of that era, Pietro Belusky, an AIA gold medal winner, um, known for buildings around the United States, be it um, a co-design of the Pan Am building in New York or the Juilliard School to the Cathedral of St. Mary in San Francisco to the world's first curtain-walled office building here in Portland with the Equitable Building here in Portland. It was kind of an, an icon to us locally here. Pietro was, even though he was born in Italy, he had spent decades here. And he kind of led a charge against postmodernism uh, uh, and, and specifically this project, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And so he really had to overcome the firm and, and the project had to overcome a lot of skepticism. And and, uh, um, uh, and then when you add on to it the layer of some of the budget issues, uh, it made for a pretty, uh, you know, kind of dramatic conversation on many levels. Um, uh, um, we mentioned Kings of Infinite Space, and uh, um, I believe it was on quite a few magazine covers at the time. Um, Patrick, I wonder if you could talk about uh, what the commission meant for Graves and, and kind of what was happening in the context of his career. Uh, uh, because if I'm not mistaken, uh, it wasn't a firm. It was quite a, a step up in scale uh, uh, and prominence for the firm, even though Michael Graves had really been part of the generation of ideas, um, you know, along with colleagues like Peter Eisenman and others. Uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, a big, a big project for the firm, right? It was a huge project for the firm. Again, we had only done residential work or some interiors projects. Um, by, say, 78, the building on the lower left of the Nassau House, that would have been a big project for Michael. And that's what his work was like. But um, these sort of neo um bits of architecture that he was known for, Michael said that they were leaving him kind of cold. And he was wondering, you know, what, is there a way to build and could have more uh, life, could be more humanist? And so literally within a couple of years, Michael was evolving, and you see the Sunar showroom at the top left, involving color, bringing in historical elements, bringing in collage. I mean, that was done at the same time that we were doing the Portland building. Um, and so you see the direction, the kind of shift that Michael's career went in. And while the Portland building was a very controversial building, it also led to a number of people uh, offering us more work. And we got invited to a lot of competitions in the 1980s, and a number of the significant projects that we completed in the 1980s were won through competitions. And uh, it was a time where people were looking for sort of bold uh, new work. Um, it also opened the door for a number of other architects as well. I think that they went from doing paper projects to getting real commissions as well. Some of that has to do with the pivot in architecture and that it was exciting. Some of it has to do with what the culture was in the 1980s. Um, for those of us who are alive, you have to remember the early days of MTV. Um, and some of it was just that the economy was picking back up again and people were building. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, it struck me when you were talking about the group of architects before that was kind of like a reminds me of cer certain movements in history and other other artistic disciplines like the French New Wave and film or you know punk rock and, and rock and roll this you know group of new people coming in with new ideas but you know it, it starts with initially with not having much experience and uh, um, I believe we actually have a, a video clip coming up that that really speaks to the youngness of the firm uh, that it uh, uh, just to get um, uh, everybody out here for the opening, you know, required some kind of creative ingenuity, uh, uh, making these artworks to sell and, and all that stuff. Uh, um, but, you know, that really speaks to the, to the sort of, uh, how it was, a not, uh, how Michael had assembled around him, especially given the Princeton connection, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a group of people with smart people with a lot of youthful energy and ideas. Um, so are we going to run that video clip now? I had a lot of people in my office that were working on it with without pay. And I said, if we build this building, we'll have an exhibition of the drawings. And we'll sell the drawings, maybe. And, and then I'll pay you through the sale of the drawings. Well, all that came to pass. The building got built. There was an exhibition. We did have all the drawings up. They did all sell. And we made enough money to pay off all the people. You know, when people want to throw eggs at the building, I think of things like that. You know, I think of the good things that happened there. And the young architects that learned how to make something in my office through the Portland building. I always feel moved when I see those video clips. Like he was, he was clearly that night kind of hurt uh, and, and sort of projecting. Like he, I remember he even said something uh, about how there should be, you know, somebody selling produce outside the venue so people could throw tomatoes at him when he spoke on stage. You know, and for someone had a, who had achieved all that he had and had achieved the name recognition that he had and impacted a whole movement the way he had, uh, uh, I hope he was able to. Um, you know, take on some confidence of that as well. But uh, here in the next slide on screen, we also have some images of uh, uh, that very um, process that Michael Graves talked about, um, these artworks that were made. And uh, uh, Patrick, do you recognize some of these people? Oh, yeah, sure. I recognize these people. <laughs> um, uh, in the late 70s and up to and through the Portland building, it's true. Michael, who is known as quite an artist, and he really was great at drawing, and he was actually fast at it too, um, would sell his original drawings at the Max Protech Gallery. And that was used to kind of keep the office going. Um, but he hated doing it. And he would always hope that we would get successful enough someday that he could stop selling his work. Uh, so uh -huh. we were all so excited about the Portland building. And in October 82, we really wanted to be there for the dedication. So Michael came up with this plan with Max Protege that we would do a limited edition of collages, sell them in the gallery, and that would fund us going out to Portland. And so here you see on the left the, the result of the collage. Michael did the first one, and then we would sit in the office in the evenings and weekends, and we'd just crank out this assembly line of, I believe we produced 150. I'm not sure how many got sold, but I know we made 150. And we all got to go to the opening of the Portland building. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Yeah, we have an image from the grand opening. And, and uh, talking with you about this in the past, uh, um, you, you've, re you've re reflected on the, it being a little bit better sweet, you know, that, that the whole team was able to make it and it was very exciting in, in so many ways, but that, you know, you got a closer look at some of those materials as well. Yes, we were, we were, before going out there, we were so excited. And a key player is in the picture on the left, the woman sitting at the very right, that's Lisa Lee Morgan. She was the architect responsible for the project. And she had a tough job. She had to deliver this building on the budget. And they kept making changes. The local architect and local contractor executed the project. They kept making changes that Michael was not happy about, uh, cheapening the materials, um, Really, that was the first moment when in the United States we started talking about reducing energy consumption. So 
They changed the glass to black glass to uh, supposedly save energy. I don't know why you'd use black glass in a city like Portland, but they did. And some of those things made Michael really mad. So Lisa was in kind of a tough spot. Um, and we were a little disappointed to see the execution of it. It really was a cheap building. Yeah. On the picture yeah. on the right, as you can see, the 22 of us who worked in the office at the time when we came for the opening. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's transition a little bit to talking about budget and materials. Uh, and uh, uh, Kristen, I have a question for you. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the responsibility that the city had. On one hand, you've got this architectural icon uh, um, but on the other hand, you've got a city office building that's leaked for way too long, um, and you've got a building that's got uh, low light levels and low ceilings uh, and fluorescent lights and big cubicles. And so um, uh, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of diagnosing that kind of wicked problem, as they say, and, and, and how you started to kind of figure that out and prioritize things and, and how what your experience taught you about, um, you know, what was going to what the city's responsibility was there. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I think you hit the nail on the head pretty clearly. As a, as a jurisdiction, as a public entity, we have multiple responsibilities. Um, and one of them was balancing this ownership of an icon with really the acknowledgement of a technical failure for many years that was uh, causing uh, problems. Um, we had mold intr uh, water intrusion causing mold. We had um, employees, uh, our PIO used to tell us that it was the world's tallest basement um, in terms of the experience of the inside of the building. And it really didn't serve the, the public that we serve um, very well either. Uh, our old uh, water bureau director used to call the space you're looking at here a, a rabbit warren. Um, it was a maze of spaces to work through. It had years and years of uh, modifications, tenant improvements that really were done without any set of standards. Um, so the interiors were, were not fantastic to begin with, um, partially due to that budget constraint. Um, as well as uh, it really wasn't the focus. And um, it's been interesting and fantastic working with Patrick through the, the project and being able to learn what it was like 30 years ago and, and transitioning to what, what do we focus on now um, in the 20th century. And yeah. really that focus on serving our em employees and serving the public and that interior uh, transformation has just been huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I cracked a joke the other day that the, you know, like uh, given all the budget constraints inside that the interior was designed by Franz Kafka or something. Uh, um, but, you know, uh, it was just astonishing to walk through the building uh, and, and experience the kind of after, as it were. And that could be as it related to offices upstairs. It could be as it related to uh, a, a a, 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 some lovely new kind of shared spaces, and it could relate as maybe as much as anything to the to the ground floor that we're going to get into. But um, you know, it just it must have been hard to attract talent um, to come work in a place like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so when I when I came onto this project, uh, I uh, had no expectation of working on this project when I joined the city of Portland. Um, and there were some fantastic people prior to me that had put a lot of work into defining the problem and working on cost estimates. And Erica was lucky enough to have been one of those people to, to really research what needed to be different and what we needed to improve. Um, and I don't think anybody anticipated it being the catalyst that it became. Uh, it really has changed how the city uh, perceives uh, the workplace of choice. Um, we had already had a number of HR uh, movements forward towards becoming the employer of choice. And now we were able to uh, translate that into the physicality. And I actually had, um, within my division, we had an employee that 
was hired and they came on a tour uh, the week before they were supposed to start and they decided not to take the job because of the experience of that building uh, prior to its renovation. And I don't think we would have that today. Um, yeah. The pictures that you are seeing here on the left, um, the top left is, is showing what the workplace was prior to reconstruction. The bottom left shows the metal panel that was hidden by wall, um, but looked like glass on the outside. And we were able to, um, with Howard S. Wright and with DLR, we were able to open all that up, expose the windows, bring in that daylight. We hired the ceilings. Um, you'll see in the next set of slides uh, in the workplaces, we actually expose the ceiling to really maximize um, that daylight and that reflection and really create uh, a better employee experience. Um, and with that also better, better public experiences on the ground floors. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I wanted to get into. And, uh, you know, I, just before we do, though, I mean, uh, I really think that more light, uh, more natural light was introduced into this renovated building than a lot of those employees expected, right? Absolutely. Um, I don't think anybody anticipated the amount of, of daylight that, that could be possible without making the exterior um, any, any significantly different. Um, as yeah. you look at the before and after pictures, um, and we really focus on artificial light as well. You know, the difference between those those old fluorescent tube lightings um, and the new the new artificial light that you're able to bring into the building and really balance that daylight so that that the daylight comes in steep as we can, and then we're we're offset by the artificial light. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's two things in these photos on screen. I think the audience would be interested to hear. Um, on the top left image, we actually see a conference room where you're able to look out to the city from behind the Portlandia statue. And that is an altogether new experience. Um, you know, you're, uh, imagine having an office building that was right behind the Statue of Liberty. You know, the Statue of Liberty is the only statue in America that's bigger than this one. And so, you know, it's just an incredible experience that never existed before. And then I wanted to point out one other thing here. Um, people might see in the top right image a little bit of an exposed coffered concrete ceiling. And um, uh, it's something really funny. I remember talking to uh, another member of the uh, design team, a leader of the design team from DLR Group, Carla Weinheimer. I pointed out to her that once they exposed the ceilings, that even though this was a postmodern building, um, the, the concrete coffered ceiling looked a whole lot like brutalism, actually. And Carla said to me, yeah, this building is just brutalism in a dress. Uh, so uh, I think that's worth pointing out. And um, uh, Kristen, you referred to the ground floor public spaces, though, and I didn't want to lose that thought. I think we have an image coming up. And uh, this is really a reinvention programmatically because we had these kind of retail covered loggia of retail spaces that were never really working very well. And the lobby was kind of too small anyway. And so the lobby kind of usurped or took over those former retail spaces and everything got glassed in. And so does it, if I'm not mistaken, that really allows for a kind of new customer service oriented experience there, right? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, one, one of the visions of this building became one city. Uh, that wasn't where we started, but through a visioning process uh, previous to this project, the different bureaus within the building were really siloed from each other, both physically and functionally. And so in order to pre provide security, every floor was locked off from one another, which really meant that employees were locked off from, from being able to collaborate with one another as well. Um, and in addition, our, our public members had to navigate through the building to figure out where they needed to go for which department and often would get directed to the wrong place and have to go to another floor and get checked in at another place. What we've done now is brought everybody down to the ground floor and the city comes to you now. We've created transparency of government by having those glass walls. We skinnied up that loggia, made it more inviting to come in. Um, and now if you need services, we come to you on the ground floor. You don't have to try to navigate where to go. Um, and we've launched a 311 program um, where we are providing services, uh, a one-stop shop, essentially, 
where the public can come in or make a phone call to one number and we will get you to the right place rather than you having to take on that responsibility. Um, And so that's really a transition and really a transformation um, and shows kind of that change in government um, that has happened over the last 30, 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And I remember at that same talk that we've showed some video clips from uh, Michael Graves even specifically cited in the possibility of glassing in those loggias and giving it back to the lobby. And so, um, you know, it's right with that. And, um, uh, you know, but we've got to, of course, talk a little bit about the exterior as well. And uh, Erica from DLR Group, I want to make sure I bring you in here. Um, I wonder if you could talk about, um, you know, the kind of the the challenge or the open question you had as to uh, what to do with that exterior and why you arrived at the decision you did, like uh, Patrick from Michael Graves had, had talked uh, earlier about how Michael Graves had said, you know, I don't care if you make it out of oatmeal, you know, done. you know, like we want to win this competition. Uh, but, you know, uh, um, you couldn't, you, you know, you would never do a painted concrete building now. And so, um, you know, why was, uh, uh, why was the aluminum rain screen the best choice? And could you just sort of talk a little bit about your team's thinking on that whole thing. And, and obviously you were really informed by a lot of experts who backed you up too. Yeah, and you know, you, you've you already touched on this a little bit, but you know, the Portland building has at its root this contradiction of being a building that was aspiring to these amazingly lofty design ideals, but you know, was essentially executed as a painted concrete box. You know, I tell people from a construction technology standpoint, um, the Portland building has more in common than a wall with a Walmart than uh, you know it does what you would associate with internationally significant architecture. Um, and you know that made the exterior renovation of the building a especially interesting puzzle to solve. Um, because we were confronted pretty much immediately with this conundrum of preserving a really revolutionary design idea without recreating uh, what proved to be problematic uh, material systems and technical detailing. And, you know, as Patrick mentioned, a lot of these technical problems aren't entirely unique to the Portland building um, and have a lot to do with the era in which the building was built and the things that, you know, the industry did not yet know or understand about building science and how these material systems would perform long term and how they would integrate with one another. Um, You know, and as Kristen talked about, we recognized that we had an obligation to solve these performance issues. You know, um, we couldn't ignore the fact that the Portland building is both an iconic piece of architecture and is also the workplace for 1,500 plus city employees who deserve comfortable working um, and and healthy working environment. Um, Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and that's when we really started to focus on you know what made the Portland building so significant. You know, it was never a building that was about painted concrete. It was about infusing this humanity back into architecture and reintroducing color and acknowledging things like history and context. And as we looked at it from that lens, we realized that recreating the design out of better performing materials was going to result in something that, you know, is still instantly recognizable and understandable as the Portland building, but also respects the fact that the building needs to function and service occupants. And you did mock-ups of this aluminum and and everybody felt that it looked good, uh, that it wasn't just a new material, but it, it looked a lot like the original vision, right? Yeah, there's actually a lot of effort put into, you know, making sure that we could render a new Portland building facade that, you know, replicated the existing design ideas and, you know, with Patrick's guidance, maybe even brought it a little bit closer to what was originally intended. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that whole philosophy of, 
you're trying to respect but still allow the building to evolve you know um was applied throughout and you know this this image i think is a good example of um you know how we you know we did change out the heavily tinted glass and to clearer glass and it did impact the appearance but you know it did so in a way that made for a better experience for the employees inside in terms of access to daylight and views and it also even makes for a more you know lively and engaging experience from the exterior you know for the first time in you know, the portland building's history it's really embodying these principles of transparent government and it looks lively and it looks like a building where things happen as opposed to kind of being this stark uh dimly lit kind of of temple and you know when we when we talked to Patrick about this, you know, he was very supportive about, yeah, that's the way governments want to function. It's the way our current government clients want to function. It's a little bit of a change in the philosophy of civic buildings. You know, they're not the unapproachable temple anymore. They're actually, you know, subservient almost to the people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Patrick, uh, what might Michael Graves have thought? Uh, I know you can't completely speak for him, and you know we're not running a Ouija board here or anything. But but I think you can form a pretty darn educated guess as to what he thought. And so, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I know he actually would have been thrilled to see this. Um, and on the topic of black glass, he he would have been thrilled to get rid of the black glass. Um, uh, the, you've shown a couple of video clips from Michael's last visit to Portland in, I think it was October 2014, and it was just months before he passed away. But on the Wednesday before he went out to Portland, Michael grabbed me and said, hey, I don't know if you know this, but they're talking about whether or not to tear down the Portland building or restore it. I'm going to be out there to speak over the weekend. Do you have any great ideas for what we could do to, to improve the Portland building? And I said, well... The first thing I do is get rid of the black glass. And Michael said, yeah, a lot of help that is. Of course you do that. Um, but then we proceeded to talk about it. And Michael had very bold ideas for what he would do. We had done a project in The Hague in the Netherlands. It was roughly a 20-some story tower where the government had bought it and was moving in the Ministry of Culture. But it had a terrible, old, failing curtain wall. And so we were hired to take off the curtain wall and put a new facade on it. So Michael's first question after the black glass conversation was, well, why can't we just do what we did in the Hague? Why can't we just pull off the facade and put on a new one? And I said, well, you can't. It's a, the facade is concrete and it's a part of its structure. You couldn't do that. And you know, we had a conversation for about 15 minutes. At the end of it, Michael was not very pleased that I didn't come up with a bunch of good ideas. But I know that this would have been exactly the kind of thing he would have hoped to find as a solution. And when I first saw DLR's proposed solution for this, I thought it was brilliant, actually. Yeah. 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 And and I think, you know, that that feeds into, you know, this element of the building as well, because I think certainly one of the most lamented features of the original Portland building um, was that parking garage that was located um, on the east side of the building across the street from you know, a public park and was really an uh, unfortunate byproduct of the original program requirements to have you know, on-site parking in the building. And you know, when the city indicated with this reconstruction project that they were no longer going to have the car parking inside the building, um, you know, that really gave us another one of these opportunities to, you know, reconnect the Portland building with its surroundings. And, you know, the first time I met you, Patrick, was actually, uh, you know, when we were in the midst of, of wrestling with this decision. And, um, we contacted you and you know, asked if you would come out to Portland and you know, talk to us about the reconstruction and these design ideas that we're forming. And you know, you you really encouraged us with this 
with the removal of this parking garage to, you know, create something special on that side of the building and, you know, to really, you know, make the most of that opportunity to create um, not just great interior public space, but that connection to the exterior public space. And, you know, I think what resulted is easily, you know, one of my favorite experiences in the building and, you know, something that, that really draws you in the minute you walk through those front doors. And, um, you know, I loved being in the building for those first few months that it was open before we all had to go into quarantine and, and really seeing, you know, people seem to regard it as a little oasis in their day, you know, to go sit there, bask in the sunlight, connect with the trees and, um, you know, that's always really satisfying, you know, as an architect. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that space there that's in the photo. And uh, um, we want to get into a little bit in the time we have remaining to talking about collaborative delivery and uh, and historic preservation practices after that. But a uh, question for Kristen. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the benefits of a collaborative de delivery model. And this is something you had had experience in, of course, before the Portland building. And, um, you know, you had to kind of make a case for this along the way, um, you and, and some other people in the department. And and uh, um, I think it's not just a collaborative delivery model, but a really, a, a, it goes beyond that. It was a collaborative culture um, where uh, everybody was working together and, and collaborating from the get-go. And so, um, you know, what does your experience teach you about that and, and maybe, you know, how you might advocate to people out there to consider it in their own projects? That's a lot of question. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna try to keep it relatively concise. This is definitely a topic that I am quite passionate about. Um, and collaboration, whether that is in your legal documents and how you structure a project or in how you walk in life and how you walk in this business world that is historically not set up for that. Um, you can do both. And uh, we've given lots of talks on this project to the DBIA and to uh, local groups and local jurisdictions and, um, and national, you know, other um, jurisdictions throughout the country have called and asked, you know, how we made this project work. Uh, the form that we took on this project is called Progressive de uh, Design Build. And the original project was Design Build, um, which is very different, actually. The two, uh, while they are very similar in name and they're both under the DBIA and their teachings, it, the way that you walk forward in it is very different. Um, and from the get-go, we talked about having the right people at the table and the right mindset at the table. And so everybody was expected and asked to take off their company hat, take off their personal hat, and really work for what's, what's the good of the project? Um, what's the good of the city? What is it that we are trying to give back? Um, and in doing that, we were then able to come up with really amazing solutions to really complex problems. Um, and. I think every day that the people sitting around the table in 2015, before this became a real project, um, stuck with it enough to figure out how legally and procurement wise with state statutes, statutes to be able to do a delivery method that structurally set up this idea of collaborative delivery. Um, mm -hmm. And then the partners that we were able to bring on board um, that really believed in the idea of collaboration at its core. Um, and it didn't matter if you were a subcontractor or if you were an engineer or if you were an intern or the you know uh, city's facilities maintenance technicians. We got everybody to the table and everybody has different experiences in life. Everybody had different uh, lenses that they looked through, stories they've been told and that really led to an amazing project um, and amazing relationships that endure today. And I get on these calls 
Um, and I just love hearing the stories and reliving those experiences. Um, I hope I get to do that again in a future project, but. Yeah, um, yeah. And it strikes me, yeah. you know, uh, we're talking about a building by a famous architect and, uh, um, you know, so often you have firms all over the nation or the world where it's one person's name on the door or a couple of people's name on the door. And a lot of times the, uh, the culture behind that isn't so collaborative. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting kind of duality that um, we know that Michael Graves himself was collaborative. Uh, Patrick has already talked about that. Um, but maybe it's worth just noting uh, that this, this, the success of this restoration uh, uh, was, you know, really down a lot to um, the fact that there was a lot of humility and teamwork on it um, and, you know, letting the best idea come through. Absolutely. And I, I have to give a shout out to our owners rep too. Um, Day CPM were, was, you know, by our side every step of the way um, as an owner it, that has not done this type of delivery method, bringing that as well. Um, and we really created a, a pretty amazing group of people. Um, right. Right. And Erica, we see, you were going to say something. Uh, we see in this photo of Carla Weinheimer from DLR, Erica, your mm -hmm. colleague, uh, uh, mm -hmm. it was the two of you that I was talking to all the time over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would have to reinforce that, you know, from, from a design side, I think there's so much of this project that would have been really difficult to achieve and uh, probably impossible to achieve at the same quality level in a different delivery method. And, you know, when I think about, um, you know, especially the, uh, the new skin design, um, you know, that was a really intense, high pressure uh, situation of knowing that you had to deliver uh, and execute a system that had an incredibly demanding set of design and performance criteria. And, you know, as, as architects, you know, there are a lot of times that we know what we want but we don't really have, you know, that full depth of expertise to fully develop, you know, the technical aspects of the design as well as the people who do it every day. And when we don't have that, you know, we don't always understand what's possible. And, you know, working on that skin and having Howard S. Wright, who is our contractor, and um, Benson Industries, who is our curtain wall trade partner, and um, Facade Forensics, who is our envelope consultant, and myself, you know, at the table from day one, starting to talk about the design before we even started designing, um, you know, we were able to you know, benefit from each other's collective knowledge, um, you know, and really come to a shared understanding of what we were trying to get to. And, and that really helped us push the envelope and achieve some things that Benson had never produced before <laughs> that, you know, we had, we certainly wouldn't have ever fathomed because, you know, I don't make curtain wall for a living and, um, you know, I'm just so incredibly pleased with what we were able to accomplish by having that collective knowledge. Absolutely. And maybe finally, before we get to the audience Q&A, uh, if you've asked a question, by the way, uh, we have seen them and we're gonna get to that in a second. But Erica, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how maybe this project in some ways tells us that historic preservation practices are, are changing just a little bit. Um, that. Uh, um, you know, the, the buildings themselves that are becoming historic are a little different case, and, uh, um, and the buildings have to work for the people inside, too. Yeah, and, and I saw in the Q&A, we actually already had uh, several questions that were, you know, touching on this issue of, you know, what, what has changed, and, you know, where are some of the disconnects with the standards? And, you know, for the most part, this project, has taught me that the rules that govern historic preservation have not evolved in a way that really acknowledges how different modern and postmodern buildings are from, you know, like their pre-World War II predecessors. 
Um, you know, post-World War II industrialization had such a huge impact on architecture that cannot be ignored. Um, and you see, you know, the shift that's happening at a really unprecedented pace uh, of acceleration where you're moving from these really well understood monolithic um, materials made by craftspeople to these very light and thin and experimental systems that you know, are made in a factory. And they don't really carry the same you know, connections to time and place that you know, materials did previously. You know, so it really goes back to this conundrum where the rules almost end up assigning this outside, outsized significance to materiality that isn't really there for these modern and postmodern buildings. And, you know, these structures were just constantly testing the limits of technology and there wasn't a long track record to look back on to see how these systems would perform. And you don't have this extensive knowledge base of, you know, repair methods built up and passed down for generations. Um, you know, the, the magical thing about, you know, mass masonry walls is they're almost infinitely repairable, um, <laughs> you know, I, I've seen them get to a state where you might not think so, but I mean, to some extent, you can always put in, you know, more mortar, you can patch cracks. But when you start looking at something like a 1980s era aluminum curtain wall system, it's a completely different animal. Um, you know, you're not going to find a contractor who's going to be willing to attempt some sort of a Dutchman style repair of, you know, splicing together <laughs> these factory extrusions to uh, to repair the those type of systems. Um, and I also think that there are a lot of these, you know, potter. Uh, modern and postmodern buildings that have a certain amount of, you know, inherent vice. And inherent vice is, you know, a, a object's tendency to, to destroy itself. And, you know, as I talked about previously with the Portland building, you know, there's definitely this element of the design ambition outstripping the technological understanding. And, you know, I do believe that there should be some serious reevaluation of these standards that really focus on the use of materials and faithful recreation of uh, system details that don't function and you know have already proven themselves not sustainable over time. And you know, I especially think that's the case when those materials are not really the key character defining feature for these buildings. Right. Right. Well, we're uh, almost at the one hour mark and uh, I'm going to uh, try and address some of these questions. Uh, I noticed that we had uh, one person uh, who rang in who was a student of Mr. Graves at Princeton in 1998. Uh, I see misses him. So uh, uh, thanks for noting that. Um, uh, let's see, we have a question here. Uh, um, uh, this project is really interesting from a historic standpoint as the original architecture design firm, uh, Michael Graves Architects, uh, was involved in the reconstruction. Uh, uh, she asks, uh, this person asks, are, are, the, are, they, are there any other examples of this collaboration with the original design firm? Um, and I don't think we necessarily have to answer that by naming other cases, but um, maybe this is worth talking about for a second, Erica and Patrick, that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, we already talked about collaboration itself, but, um, you know, uh, I wonder if, you know, it was just automatic kind of figuring out how you were going to work with each other. You know, DLR was the architect, but, but um, you know, Mike, Patrick and Michael Graves' firm had a lot of the answers that you needed about not intent, not only intent, but a lot of other things. And so, um, you know, is there a kind of teachable moment in how you two, uh, you two firms were able to work together? 
Well, um, you know, I will say from our part, uh, we were a little nervous when we thought about uh, the prospect of, of reaching out to, uh, to Patrick and to uh, Michael Graves' firm. And I think a lot of it is, you know, we didn't know how they would respond. Um, you know, we didn't know if they would feel you know, very protective and, and defensive about the building or, you know, if, if we could have this kind of open and productive dialogue um, so it just so happened another, uh, one of DLR group's offices was, was working with, uh, Graves's office on, I think it was the Madonna rehabilitation hospital. So we had sort of an internal, uh, connection to Patrick, um, and Carla and I were assured that, um, he was a lovely human being and that we should definitely reach out. Um, and we did, and I have to say, uh, you know, our experiences were just beyond what we could have hoped for in terms of being able to have that sort of, you know, collaborative and you know, open conversation. And Brian, um, you use the word, uh, humility about this project, um, I definitely feel like that is just something that has struck me about all of our dealings with, uh, with Patrick and with Michael Graves's office is there's just that lack of, uh, you know, insurmountable ego that you might expect with working with a firm that has this kind of, uh, stature and track record. So, um, you know, I, I personally, you know, can't, can't thank you enough, Patrick, for just everything that you brought us in terms of, of insight and support. And, and I would say thank you for inviting us. I was happy to be part of the team and we should all be working with each other instead of against each other. Um, you know, an, an example that's similar, uh, earlier in the presentation, I showed you a photograph of the Banasaraf house. That was actually a completely restored Banasser house that we did just a couple of years ago. The house was in terrible shape and had really fallen apart. And there were new owners, but they understood that it was an important house in architectural history. So they came to the office and Michael and I met with them and they said, we're going to hire an architect to restore this. Would you assist in some ways? And Michael got mad and said, why would you hire another architect? Why wouldn't you hire us? And, my, and they said, well, we're gonna to wanna to make some changes to modernize it. And Michael said, I would wanna modernize it. I wouldn't wanna put back what was there. So Michael was an open thinker and he pretty typically was just losing, looking for the best solution. And so yeah. I was impressed when we saw DLR's proposal because it seemed like somebody figured it out. They had the right solution because the problems with the facades were huge. It wasn't just, why don't you put another paint job on it? They were failing. Water was getting in the building in many places. They were just going to get worse. You had to come up with a solution, not a paint job. Interesting, interesting. A uh, couple of other questions here. One person had asked, uh, um, had said that most of the photos of the interior seem to show uh, 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 some of the areas where there's the most glass and, and how does the interior look in the spots where there are only tiny windows. And I can answer that myself really saying, that it looks full of light, you'd be surprised. Um, the whole mm -hmm. interior, not just portions of the interior are full of light. Um, and uh, this relates to another question that someone asked that um, perhaps Erica or Patrick, you could answer, um, which is that, uh, are there lessons to be learned here for say you have a building that is maybe of a, a, let's say a 1980s vintage or a 1970s vintage that it's not a historic building, but they want to do the sustainable thing. You know, this is the most sustainable building you can build is, is to renovate the building that's already there, as we all know. And so um, we've talked a lot about historic preservation and that's what a lot of this is about, but um, were there some lessons that could maybe be applied to just a little bit more, if I may say a garden variety 80s building? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there certainly are, um, 
you know, I, I think obviously we had, we had multiple factors that we had to deal with in terms of, you know, it was still a project that we had to get through uh, landmarks review uh, in terms of being able to, to replicate the, um, the historic detailing, but, you know, the, the issue of the performance of these buildings is, is not a small one. And I think there's always a little bit of that balancing act that you have to do between, you know, you've got a certain amount of, you know, embodied energy in the materials that are already there, but, you know, you're also dealing with buildings that are oftentimes, you know, very inefficient um, and not necessarily providing healthy environments for their occupants. Um, so I think there was another uh, question in the, in the Q and a that um, alluded to the idea of, of precedent. And I think that's part of this answer as well. Um, you know, as, as a society, sometimes I think that we become far too engaged in the issue of precedent and it takes away an element of discretionary thinking. You know, um, standards are great and standards are there to act as a guide. But, you know, when we treat standards as these really prescriptive uh, type of, of sets of rules and regulations that tell you how to solve every problem, you know, it takes away some acknowledgement that the problems are different for every building. The problems are different, you know, for what's your climate, what's your location. Um, and those are things that I think should not be ignored. I think that, you know, we should definitely be taking very critical views of all of the, uh, the factors that, that feed into, um, you know, how buildings are performing or how historic they are, what they're made of. Yeah. And I yeah. think something else that I think was very successful about this project is they brought the workplace environment up to date. In 1979, 80, there was nobody talking about workplace environment. There wasn't a topic. Um, but today we all care so much about what is the environment like that we're going to be working in every day. Does it have good daylight? Is it a healthy place mm -hmm. to be? And to me, that's equally a successful part of this project is how much improved the environment is for people. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, Kristen, one thing that occurs to me also, uh, I think we touched upon this briefly, but it might be worth noting here is uh, um, we, we've got people coming back after the pandemic and uh, you, you, you sort of planned and designed this building in one era before the pandemic, and we have people coming back um, to maybe a limited degree now or soon, if not, if not now, soon. Uh, and so doesn't it seem like this building is set up to be more adaptable in the future than it ever has, and that it's pretty, it's a, that uh, even though it wasn't designed in the pandemic, that it's kind of um, friendly to a post-pandemic era? Absolutely. Um, as... Erica mentioned around standards, the building was actually built with office standards, so to speak, and it was purposely designed for future flexibility. And so we did a lot on the infrastructure to ensure that as the workplace changes in the future, because really that's all we knew about the workplace, is that it's always, always going to be changing. And we did not want to... Uh, redo what had happened before, which is to have this multitude of renovations over time in this building that led to poor HVAC, uh, you know, poor air quality, poor light quality, because you're doing things in the moment instead of future thinking. And so this building, we really took a, a standardized approach to the office workplace. And so you can use the interior environment in a multitude of ways without, without physically changing the building, but just with changing the furniture. We have conduit run to be able to handle multiple furniture layouts and furniture setups. Um, and then the sizes of the rooms are sized to be able to be used for different purposes. So as we're starting to re-envision 
what coming back to the workplace will be post COVID. Um, we're really starting to have those conversations of how are we going to occupy the same exact space just in a different way. Um, so spaces that previously may have been a private office, those are, you know, potentially meeting rooms or, uh, we may not have as much need for individual heads down workspace. We may have more need for collaboration because people are finding they want to do their heads down work on days at home and they want to come into the office to do collaboration. So how do we rearrange the furniture for team collaboration in a greater way? Those are the conversations we're having now um, in that post COVID environment. Um, we'll yeah. see where it goes. I, uh, I did a, uh, I worked on an article uh, for the American Society of Interior Designers about the future of workplaces and workplace design recently. And there was some research, some survey research showing that um, uh, something like 80 or 85% of people don't want to go back to the office five days a week, but not many people necessarily want to keep working from home either. And so I think right. the average person wanted to spend like on average about two and a half days a week. But it strikes me that um, for those who do go to the office, um, one, it has to feel like a place that they can do quality collaborative work that that has natural light and all those things. Um, but then two, uh, um, it has to feel like they're going to get good work done when they're when they're there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're ever going to go back to people not focusing on clean, safe workplaces as well. Um, and so having, having lines and services that are easy, easily cleanable, um, that can be disinfected and sanitized, having routes that can be um, focused on in that way, I think will be, uh, will serve us for a long time as well. Yeah. When, uh, what's your best guess as to when, uh, this will be, uh, you know, full of people, full of workers again, uh, or as close as we can get to it. I know you don't know for sure, but um, um, do you feel optimistic that people are going to be in here soon? Um, I think that changes on a day by day basis. You know, I think we were all hoping that the vaccines would uh, bring a level of freedom that we aren't quite seeing us get to. Um, we are getting regular updates from our CAO on expectations for employees. Um, my guess is the earliest that it would be occupied in any real significant way would be this fall. There have been, there have been about 60 to 100 people on average a day still working there um, because we do have certain tasks and certain positions that cannot work offsite. Um, but as we start to ramp up, I'm guessing it's still probably a year or two out at least until we know what the future of the workplace is going to be, um, mm -hmm. because there will be that phase in period where some people are coming back, some people are not, and we're not yet to our new norm. So when will we get to the new norm? I'm not sure. Um, I think uh, it's everybody's best guess. And I've been on many calls nationally and internationally now um, yeah. to try to put that crystal ball out there. And I don't think yeah. anybody quite yeah. has it. Well, we're going to wind up here in a second. And, uh, you know, and as we look at this final slide here, you know, it reminds me that the Portland building can really be a symbol of, of rebirth in the city. Um, you know, every city in town in America has had a rough past year with uh, the pandemic and some of our social justice issues that have come up. And, uh, you know, Portland has some ways, in some ways, come to symbolize that maybe more than most cities. And uh, we look at a, a photo here of uh, a reminder of that it sits on this, you know, beautiful trio of park blocks, and um, it's part of it's right next door to City Hall, and it's really a kind of beautiful civic room that it um, occupies, and it, it feels like you know it's really going to kind of there's so much symbolism that's inherent to the architecture here, um, but you know we see a kind of reimagination of of history and historic forms and and the idea i think you really see it here that this is a civic building that is also you know looking towards the, looking back to the past and to the future so um as we go in our final seconds here though i really want to just say thank you to all of our participants uh um patrick and and erica and Kristen. uh 
Um, you know, it's been fun talking with you, not only uh, in this conversation, but over the last few years as, uh, as we've taken this story to some different audiences. And uh, uh, thank you for, for talking now and, and for doing that. As a Portlander, I say thank you for doing the good work that you've done as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs>